a real pleasure to be at North Carolina State. I've been in this field for many, many years, and I've never been uh, to North Carolina State. Um, so it's great to be here, and it's also wonderful to be part of the Stinger series uh, with uh, Duke and University of North Carolina. Um, and I certainly thank the department, and especially Tao, for, for inviting me. So um, I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been doing at University of Virginia. Please, please do sit down. Um, for a number of years, we've been um, doing work to detect vulnerabilities or faults in the source code. And the um, goal of this work that we've been doing is that we develop techniques that are static, meaning that we only want to be able to look at the source code to detect faults, uh, that it be scalable. We want it to be able to at least run a million, if not more, lines of code, and precise as possible with static analysis and automatic. Um, and for the most cases, most of our work has centered on individual faults. So we've looked at buffer overflow, we've looked at integer overflow, individual fault, faults. Today, I'm going to give a talk that's different in two aspects. Our first, this talk is not about detecting faults, but about diagnosing faults. So we want to be able to, to uh, 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 identify the root cause of a fault and to fix it. That's one difference. The other difference is that we're not only looking at individual faults, but we're looking at a combination or we want to group faults, okay? And this grouping of faults is what we call correlation. Um, in this project, we also have the goals of scalability, preciseness, and automatic. The work is basically uh, the work of one of my PhD students, Wei Li, who should be graduating soon and is just a superb student. I have to make a pitch for her, she told me. <laughs> So um, with fault detection, which is what I just mentioned, there have been a lot of research and a lot of development on detecting faults. Uh, there are many commercial and academic tools available to use. Um, there have been approaches that are dynamic. In other words, you detect fault as the code runs. And there are uh, techniques that are static, that all they do is look at the source code. Um, for the most part, the techniques are automatic and fast, they're not necessarily scalable, but when they work on code that's the right size, they're fast. And with these tools, and I've listed a few of them, these are some of the tools from Microsoft, uh, thousands, even millions of reports are generated. So you know every time you're using Microsoft product and you get a little screenshot that says uh, there's been a problem, you want to send a report, well, those are reports to go, so they're trying to detect that a fault occurred. All right, the other side of detecting the fault is how do you diagnose it? And for the most part, fault diagnosis has not received the same amount of attention that detection has. And uh, the techniques are usually manual, and they're fairly slow since they are manual. And Microsoft reported that a, a particular person looking to diagnose a fault can only do about 15 to 20 uh, reports per day. That doesn't mean they necessarily find the fault, but they study these reports. And another study showed that a person can only handle about 120 lines of code per hour. So this shows you that if you're getting millions of lines, millions of reports, the fault diagnosis is not as efficient as we would like. So when I talk about diagnosis, what we want to do is to be able to identify the root cause and to fix the cause of the root. Um, now, for the most part, the approaches that have been done, mainly manual, have been statically done open program code. So you look at the source code, the inspector looks at the source code and tries to figure out where the faults are or what the fault, what's the cause of the fault. And it happens before or after execution. So, in other words, when you send a report to Microsoft that there's, you know, they know there's an error, an error has been detected, then that's after the execution, but there's no input, and that's what makes it hard. And so, Microsoft does use, along with these reports, they, they uh, send the uh, 
the stack as well as the PC where the crash occurred. Um, if you try to diagnose a fault under execution, we call that debugging. Not only we, but this, uh, the committee typically refers to that as debugging. So what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do, is to statically look at code and determine what the root cause is. Now, there are many challenges in doing this, which is why there hasn't been a lot of success. It's mainly uh, one of the reasons is the root cause can be located far away from where a particular fault is detected. So if your program crashes or a buffer overflow occurs, the place where the root cause is can be far away. Uh, the number of faults and false alarms can be overwhelming. So if you look at any of these reports, they're reporting all kinds of false alarms. And um, it's very difficult, and they don't prioritize it. So it's very difficult for a person doing diagnosis to figure out which fault to look at. And as I say, there's little or no runtime information. Um, the, at most, you get the stack, the call stack, and the program counter. So the goal of our research project for this particular research was we want to be able to develop static analysis techniques to help with the diagnosis. And remember, I want these to be automatic. Um, we want to know how did faults propagate along the path. So we know that there's a fault. We want to detect the root cause. How did they propagate along the path? Um, we want to know, did one fault cause another fault? Um, can we group these faults together so that they can be diagnosed together? In that way, we can maybe find the root cause of one fault, which would then satisfy a number of faults, which is really what happened. And again, we want it to be automatic, scalable. And because we're looking at paths, we have to use path-sensitive analysis. Now, um, you know that there are a potentially an exponential number of paths in a program. And so uh, usually path analysis is too path sensitive analysis is too expensive, and most of our static analysis techniques use path insensitive. But if we're interested in the path, we need to have path sensitive. And I'll talk about how we do that. All right, so the key idea that we had in this research is that we want to compute a relationship among the faults. And we call this correlation. So the faults have a relationship, and so they're correlated. Um, so given a set of faults, we want to identify the causality relationship among the faults along particular paths. So if you have two faults, if you have three fa faults, did one fault cause the other fault, which then caused the third fault? Um, we also want to be able to detect new faults caused by existent faults. And so what happens uh, when you're finding faults in a program is that unless you find one fault, you may not find another fault. So uh, typically that happens with buffer overflow. If you only look at buffer overflow, you're going to, look, you're going to uh, not find all the faults of buffer overflow because you have to look at integer overflow or truncation and some of those errors will cause a buffer overflow. And so we want to be able to detect those. We want to help explain the risks or causes of the faults. And we want to group faults based on the correlation. Again, we want to do this because uh, sometimes you, you only have to look for one, one root cause and solve uh, or diagnose a number of faults. All right, so I've been using the term fault pretty loosely, and you may wonder what we mean by a fault. And so what the kind of faults that we're looking for are program points in the program, in the code, where a particular property is violated. And we have certain properties or certain constraints, and when those properties or constraints are violated, we call that a fault. And so that would mean um, things like uh, buffer overflow, where the constraint is that the buffer size is greater or equal to the string that we put in the buffer. Integer overflow, we know that there's a maximum size of the buffer of the integer. Um, memory leak, protocol violation, 
things such as two freeze, double free, and that's a, a very famous kind of um, vulnerability where you free and then you free again. So we, we are looking at faults where we could say there's a potential for a fault to occur at this statement. So we're not looking at, we're not looking at uh, missing statements or if you've changed the variable, you should have used an integer or x against y. Yes. Are program specifications considered faults? I mean, uh, considered constraints? Uh, violating a specification? Yes. So as long as you could express, as long as you can look at the code and pick a particular statement that may violate constraint or specification, then that's part of it. But it's not if you have constraints such as a specification such as the code will run in this amount of time, we're not considering those kind of faults. So it's statement oriented. Can you give, give the example of integer overflow? Uh, uh, in my mind, uh, is uh, uh, this is a, a dynamic feature, right? I make a computer number that's too large. You okay. can detect that. Yes. So whenever you have an, an integer that's too large, whether it's a short integer or a double precision integer or whatever you have, there's a certain uh, size that that integer should be. And if it exceeds that, then something happens during runtime. It cannot, it cannot represent that large, large integer. And that's what I mean. But if it's a static analysis, I'm trying to be confused. Yeah, yeah, I'll, like, I'll get to uh, that. There's a static That's analysis. right. Static so remember, we're doing all this statically. Right. And, you'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. <coughs> and, um, and we're trying to discover how a fault propagates. We're trying to do it static. It's a very good point. So the rest of my talk, I've talked about the motivation. I've given you some intuition about fault correlation, fault causality. And so now I'm going to more precisely to identify or define what we mean by fault correlation, talk about a fault uh, correlation graph, um, talk about how to compute these fault correlations. Uh, we've implemented the scheme and had some experiments, which I will discuss. Okay, so uh, by uh, fault correlation, again, as I just said, it's a relationship based on the dynamic behavior of a fault. So if you run this code, what's the dynamic behavior? What's going to happen? Um, and what's going to happen is the fault, as I said, could cause another fault. And what we're doing is we're propagating the error state. The error state of a fault can propagate causing other faults. So for example, if you have an integer overflow, it could be that your system returns uh, a, a, a ne negative number. And then you're going to use that, and it's going to be incorrect. Or if a buffer overflow occurs, then the error state is that what's in the buffer is too long, and you can overwrite things. So the error state of a fault can propagate, causing other faults. Or, and this is important, which we found, which we didn't expect to find and didn't have in our initial discussion of this, caused infeasible paths to be feasible. So we detect infeasible paths, and that means there's no input that will ever execute that path. And sometimes a fault can cause one of these infeasible paths to be feasible. So you don't think this path is going to be executed, and it is. And um, we're going to be able to group these correlated faults. So here's a definition now, F1 and F2. If you have two faults, F1 and F2. And um, if we call these correlated, if F2 occurs because of the propagation of the error state of F1. So something happened, will happen dynamically at F1, which will cause F2 to be a fault. We call that correlated. Now, it doesn't mean this is the only root cause. Here we have another root cause of that violation. You can have more than one. And you can, they can occur on different paths. We say that um, correlation is uniquely correlated if there's only one possibility of F1 causing F2. There's no other faults that can cause F2. And that means if you fix the fault R F1, you automatically fix fault F2. Okay. 
Okay, now, yes. Say F1, does F1 manifest with a different set of external visible anomalies from F2, or do they just come together as one anomaly? Um, it could be that some of them, in fact, or we call them invisible, that you don't know that there's a fault there. It's not that the buffer overflows or that you get a crash or anything. They're called invisible, and so you don't know they're happening. And that error state, whatever it is, will propagate to F2. Yeah, so you don't know necessarily at one time. And it could be F2 is invisible. Okay, so if we know these faults and if we can correlate them according to those definitions, then we can do our, we can um, automatically produce a correlation graph. And a correlation graph is a set of nodes that represent all the faults in the program. So we're looking at now the whole program and we're saying let's try to have a global view of the faults in this program. And we do that with the correlation graph where you, you can just see the graph where it has all these faults and then we draw edges to represent correlation. This is a directed graph. Okay. Yes, it is a directed graph. It's based on causality. So finally, here's an example of a fault, a fault correlation. If I looked at this example, and essentially all it's doing is reading in some values, name, uh, an integer, which is a CD buff in a token, and it's sitting the buffer size CD buff. It's allocating a buffer size of uh, uh, that size, buff size. And it's going through some kind of authorization to say, is this a legitimate object? It copies, mem copy. So it's going to copy CB buff characters of name into buff. And then it checks the authorization. And it either grant, grants access or denies it. So very simple. And in fact, this is uh, from a real program to kind of uh, narrow down the important parts. And if you look at this program, you'll see that there are a number of vulnerabilities, a number of faults. First of all, there's a fault right here, which is a um, integer violation, in that um, you're reading in a number, C, B, buff, and you're putting into a short integer. And since you're reading it in, it could be larger than the maximum size of the um, buff size. All right, so we have integer violation. If you look at buffer overflow, you see that there's a buffer overflow right here because the buffer size is buff size and it could be smaller than change buff, depends on what happens there. And it's taking the number of characters of CB buff and storing it into buff. And if you look a little further, this, over, this fault will cause a, a authorization elevation. So a person will be able to get into the authorization even though uh, uh, he or she should not be able to. Okay, so here's how, the, how, how we're going to get into trouble. We've allocated buffer size according to buff size, which is a short integer. Um, but then we're going to store um, name of CB buff, which could be a larger integer because of what happens at runtime when you try to do uh, CB buff a very large number into a short integer. And on a stack, we're going to have the buffer stack allocated, but then we're going to put names, names in the buffer and it could overflow into the authorization uh, variable and change its value, okay? So now, and this is a real program, um, so now we can see that although these individual faults may not have a big uh, uh, impact, the final impact is very large because we're allowing people into the system that should get it. Okay, now here's the graph, and this comes from um, OpenSSH. Uh, again, a real program, that kind of code. 
In this graph, it's just showing you have um, a fault at and line one, both sides. Um, you're in line four. You're allocating uh, something H to buff size, and then you're going to do the authorization failure. So this is saying that these are all correlated, right? And so now I've, I'm just giving you this other. This is simple because it's too hard to explain a very complicated uh, example um, online, and so. Now, this is another uh, uh, cor uh, cor graph, uh, correlation graph, a polymorph. And you can see all the correlation in here. So this overflow causes this one, this one, this one, this one. This overflow and this one cause this. This overflow causes this one. So in fact, if you fix this overflow, even though you have all of these errors, you're going to be able to fix the all of these, all of the errors. Um, this plus means that, in fact, there are more than one path um, that caused this uh, 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 fault. So we're looking at the paths. Okay. So what do we know now from the analyzing that code? We know that the, the integer is vulnerable. And we better fix it. It has high priority because it causes buffer overflow. The buffer overflow can be exploited, and exploitation can cause the privilege uh, elevation. And the root cause is the integer violation. And we can also tell you how the path is exploited, along which path, along which path in the code. Again, the example is pretty simple, but along which path you had this violation. So the big question you should be asking right now is, oh, this is all well and good, but is it academic research? And that it doesn't occur. And so we don't have, I showed you two examples, and maybe those are the only two examples in the world that have correlation. And so we worried about that. And so we started looking at reports, vulnerability reports, not we. My students started looking at vulnerability reports. And there's a database called the Common Vulnerabilities and, and Exposure database, which has millions of millions of reports, and so she looked at this vulnerabilities to find out from the reports what was causing uh, uh, another fault. So we found that the fault correlation widely exists. It's in many many programs, many most. It exists along different paths and between different types of faults. So the one example that I gave you showed buffer overflow causing buffer overflow causing buffer overflow. That's one type. But you also saw in that other example where we had integer overflow causing buffer overflow causing um, authorization violation. And the code inspector manually correlates these faults. Um, I've talked about this research. This research, by the way, has not been published yet. Um, I talked to a number of people about this, and mainly they say, oh, yeah, that's the way the code inspector inspection is done. We try to figure that out. And so what we're doing is trying to find an automatic technique to do this. So here's a study um, that shows what, what was found. And this star means that it, it we found correlation. The X means that we found unique correlation, and unique is good because we only have to fix one. What's CVE? That's the, um, the database, Common Vulnerability and Exposure Database. Um, and we also uh, found causes marked here that a root cause produces different symptoms along different paths. Okay, so a root cause may cause one kind of vulnerability along another path and another type along another path. And you can see here, we've listed all the, many of the vulnerabilities, faults, and whether or not we found instances. And you can see that um, null pointer, integer causes null pointer um, dereferencing. Integer causes an inter overflow will cause a double free to occur. A buffer causes non-pointer faults and also double free. And so you can look at this and see that, in fact, many of the faults that we talk about, and in particular vulnerabilities, um, 
Art corner. Yes. Loop. Um, how do you explain the loop? Loop is an infinite out. loop. It gets into uh, infinite, infinite loop. loop. It's a denial of service. Okay. okay. So it's a not denial of service. All right. So we know that it occurs. We know we kind of have a definition of it. So how do we compute it? Um, well, first of all, you, we want a general framework because we don't want to have, which happens in, in fault detection. Usually there's an algorithm for computing buffer overflow, another algorithm for computing integer overflow. And we want to have some kind of framework where we put all the faults together and we look for correlations. Uh, and so we need a general framework or a general technique that will look at many different kinds of faults. And we have to potentially um, model the dynamic impact of the fault. So during runtime, what is this fault going to do? Okay. So we have to model that. So you know with an integer and a buffer overflow, you're going to get some value that's tainted or incorrect. And so that's going to be propagated, just like in that example I showed you, where if you put um, change CD buff into a short integer, if that value is, is large, then it's going to be different in the two different cases. Our resource exhaustion is caused by a resource leak, and that could be modeled by an infinite loop. And so type state errors caused by protocol violations. And so you have to be able to dynamically um, model what's going to happen. And it doesn't have to be the exact thing that's going to happen using some kind of system. But in general, what will happen? So did you come up with model for empirical data or, or another way? I'm sorry? Did you come up with the model from the empirical data that you observed? Um, that helped us. Okay. That helped us. So how do we model? Well, again, we have all of these reports that from the common database of vulnerabilities that we can look to see what the inspector was saying. And we help reuse that. You know, like um, the value produced was such and such. And then it caused this, and so we use that. OK, so we still have, besides those challenges, we have the scalability challenge, which I mentioned before, and that we want to be able and, uh, to uh, analyze millions of lines of code. Um, but our technique is path-based. So we're looking how uh, uh, faults are, are translated along paths. And we know that it's very expensive to do this, and it's not scalable. And so our approach is to use demand-driven. And in our previous work on, on uh, fault detection, we came up with using demand-driven and showed that it is scalable to about 1.4 million lines of code. Um, and that what we're doing is starting with the potential statements that could cause a problem and then going in demand. So we don't look at all the paths. We only look at the paths that we need to. We want to be able to analyze the whole program because these reports that we looked at show that, in fact, many of the coordinations occur across procedures. And so we need to have interprocedural analysis. And again, we want this to be as automatic. We want it to be automatic. OK, so to compute fault correlation now, <clears throat> there are two parts. First of all, we have to detect and we can do that by using um, some of the techniques that already exist. Uh, again, typically they detect individual faults, like buffer overflow or some kind of one particular kind of fault. Now, we can use any fault detection techniques if they return the fault, but they also have to tell us the error path. And many of the techniques don't do that because they're not path sensitive, right? But if if you have an error, uh, if you have a detection technique that tells me what the path is uh, between this fault and this fault, I can handle it. Now, what we've done is to compute this using our demand-driven framework. So using a demand-driven framework, we compute the faults, we detect the faults, and then we use the same framework to detect correlations. And that means we can get path sensitive. And I, I have an example. All right, so then we have a representation, an interprocedural control flow graph. 
of the program, uh, which is used a lot in software engineering. And then based on that, we coordinate faults across all faults. So could the first stage be dynamic analysis, like testing, I give you a question input. Would your approach accommodate that? Um, yes. If you can tell me that this statement is at fault and this statement is at fault and you give me the path, then I could tell you the correlation, whether this fault caused that one. Yes. That's the only thing we need. Two, um, the faults and the path between the faults. So I assume the demand driven doesn't only apply to path, but also to the interprocedural aspect. Absolutely. So when you go uh, across, well, when you're going across interprocedural calls, that's a program path. And so we're going across procedure calls and procedure returns. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, I'm going to show you now the fault detection so that you can understand the fault correlation a little better. And so what we do with demand-driven, and it's demand-driven, all demand-driven algorithms work by a query system. Right? You, you have a demand. You want to know something. You set up a query. And then that query is propagated until it gets the answer. And so the query is based on the constraints of the program points to ensure the program property. So in other words, if you're writing into a buffer, then the constraint is that the final buffer size of the string you're writing in has to be smaller or equal to the buffer size. That's a constraint. If you're doing any kind of arithmetic, and you're storing something in an integer, then the value of what you're computing has to be smaller or equal to the largest integer that the machine, that that particular type has. OK, then we backward propagate the query until we resolve, until we can say, yes, the string that you're putting in here is less than or equal to the buffer size, or yes, the integer is smaller than the maximum. And so this is how it, how it goes. We raise the query. We propagate the query in a backwards direction. We re try to resolve the query. If we cannot resolve it, we continue to propagate it until we can resolve it, or we stop. And then we forward the resolution, and we get the program path, right, and the faults. So again, here's the example. I'm going to show you how this works. So let's, um, we have, first of all, we're looking for integer overflow. And we see that this, we get a violation right away. Um, that's our query. And the query is, is change buff, change b buff greater than 0 or less than and uh, and the ch buff less than or equal to short. The shortest, the largest you can put in there. All right? And if we wanted to know the, whether this is a fault, we have another query that says, is the buff this size greater or equal to change buff, the CB buff? Those are the queries. Those are the constraints that in order for this not to have a fault would not be violated. And this one, the query, is the type state of object equal to authorization. Have we authorized this? And so these are the queries. Every kind of statement that can cause a problem, a fault that we're looking for, we set up a query. And this is previous work that we did. Yes? Just out of curiosity, you have the classification of faults, and the queries clearly relate to that. Um, is this based on, for example, recognizing that there's a mem copy? Or how do yes. you do this? Um, so if I hide my mem copy in something else, it's a library function. So anytime you have an operation, so it works on an operation. Oh, it, it doesn't really care that it's a mem copy. No. If it if it works on an operation of changing the buffer size, then that's a, that's, and so there are a lot of commands: a string copy, uh, uh, string, uh, all kinds of things, where you would raise this kind of a query. So it's any operation. That changes the size, that changes what you're putting in a buffer. Okay. All right, so now um, 
we know that this is an integer violation. Let's do the, um, let's show an example where we're going to do a buffer overflow. We're going to set up the query, and the query is the size of the buffer greater or equal to CD buff. And we propagate it backwards. This has nothing to do with the query, and so we continue to propagate it. Now we know that buff is of size buff size. So we substitute uh, uh, buff size for buff, and we want to know is buff size greater or equal to change buff, or CD buff. And then we go up here, and we see the buff, CD buff is greater or equal to CD buff, uh, because that's buff size. And so we get true. All right, now what this is showing, that if you only did buffer overflow, you would not find that to be an overflow. Right? This is true. The query is that the fault detection would say it's safe. This is not buffer overflow because we don't know about that integer yet. So that's showing that one fault is showing that integer violation can cause that other violation. All right. So that's the way that demand driven works, though. And you just go along the paths, you're going along all the paths until you get to a point where you can resolve the query. Okay, um, and so we're going to compute two different kinds of correlations, one of which is that the error state, the dynamic error state of the first fault directly impacts the second fault and causes an error state. And then, as I said, the error state of the second fault changes the feasibility of the program, which turns infeasible or faulty paths to be feasible. Okay, so here's now how to how to compute fault correlations. Um, we integrate the faults, the error state based on the fault type. So we, we model what the behavior, the runtime behavior of the fault, and we integrate that. We identify change feasible paths, and then we identify correlations and find new faults. So in the correlation, we're going to find two existing faults that we've already found correlate. One causes one. And we're also going to say, because this is a fault, it's going to cause another fault, which I could not tell by just looking at individual faults. And that was the case of the buffer overflow. If I only looked at buffer overflow, I would not be able to determine that. So again, here's an, an example where um, the uh, buff size integer truncation is the buff size can be less than change buff because of the short. Okay, so we know that's the dynamic behavior. If the value in uh, the value of this uh, buff size could be smaller than change buff. Okay, um, so now. We're going to continue to, to work on this, and we see that um, here, if we, we really do the query in the backwards direction, that size of buff is great is equal to change buff. So if we go in the forward direction, you see that, in fact, the change, the size of buff is, is equal to the change of buff. Um, and so when we propagate it back here, we see that here we go. Um, buff size has to be greater or equal to change buff, and we see here the buff size is less than buff. And so we know that integer, this, vi this integer violation, this integer violation causes this to happen. Okay, so that's how it works. Um, and now what we did was to implement this and evaluate it. And we wanted to evaluate it on real world applications. And our algorithm can automatically compute fault correlations. So we don't have to um, compute anything manually. The only thing we have to model is the error state. Um, and um, we implemented it. Some of you are using the Microsoft Phoenix infrastructure. And we use that. Uh, Microsoft has open source on the Phoenix, Microsoft Phoenix framework. 
and we used their Microsoft Resolver, and they were very helpful with us in using this. Um, we had three types of faults as case studies, integer violation, buffer overflow, and null pointer re re referencing. And we used nine real world uh, benchmarks. So does your tool work on binary or source code level? It works on an intermediate representation. So um, the Microsoft um, Phoenix compiler, in fact, will take your source code and convert it to three different kinds of representations, high level, medium level, and low level. And we use the medium level. So it, in fact, works for any language that you can put into the Microsoft Phoenix compiler. Um, OK. So here's uh, what we found. We use these benchmarks. Um, some of them are very large. Um, uh, Pachi is very large. And these are pretty, I mean, these are established benchmarks. So we're not going to find a lot of bugs, faults, because they have been tested and tested and tested. But we know that some of them exist because they've been reported. And we know in this one, for example, there are four, we, a uh, fault detector detected four uh, faults, which is what, they, what it has. And they were buffer overflows. Here's an integer. And we didn't find any pointer uh, yet, any pointer dereferencing faults. All right, then we looked at the fault correlations. And we found with the buffer, the four buffer overflows, there were six pairs of correlations. All right, so there were six. Um, we also found here that there were of three integer, integer, integer buffers. We found four correlations, and in fact, we discovered another um, another fault that we hadn't discovered before. And so this this here is 17, and they had all kind of integer, 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 buff, buff, integer. So they had all kind of correlations. Okay, so we found a number of correlations, um, and this tells us the faults from the correlations. So this is really one fault. And all of these are caused by four. And, and so on. We couldn't discover some of these. So here's the um, characteristics of our, thing, of our um, experiment. And this node tells you the number of nodes in the correlation graph. This is correlation graph. And it really mirrors the number of faults detected. Um, this, tell, this column tells you the kind of correlations we found. Was there only one type, buff, buff, or were there more? And so this says there was only one type of correlation. And here we had three. So we had int, int, and buff, and so on. Um, this, this one tells us the, the components of the correlation graph. So um, when you draw the correlation graph, you're going to have nodes, and these are the components. So we had, like, even though we had 14 faults over here, we only had two clusters, essentially, of faults. All right, so to diagnose 17 faults, you really only had to look at two clusters that, that are coordinated. So if we can, we, we have a priority then, we look at the entry node, and this tells us on average um, how many entry nodes. Um, and this path, one of the pieces of information that we wanted to know is, is this truly interprocedural? And so we wanted to know how many, how many um, interprocedural paths, how many times do we go across a procedure call? And so you can see that we went across a procedure call quite often. OK, so from this, from our experimentation, we see that fault correlation exists between the same and different types of faults. Um, coordinated faults can be found in the same procedure or across procedure calls. Um, different coordinations can ex exist around different paths that go through a fault. So this truly is path sensitive. So you could have a fault. And another fault, and they can correlate along this path, 
And you can have a fault and this fault and it correlates along this path, or this fault along this path doesn't correlate. So you really do have to look at the paths. And this correlation graphs can effectively group the paths. And so what that means is that we're essentially setting priorities because you want to you want to isolate on those um, entry nodes of all the components of the correlation graph. And there's some nodes that aren't correlated. And so you would have to look at those too. But it really does filter down the and, and prioritize the diagnosis. So the user scenario is that you um, you run the detector and you find uh, uh, the exists the correlation between um, existing faults, and you then detect and correlate new faults based on the information, and then you can compare or you look at the correlation graph and the symptoms of dynamic failure to help group and diagnose crash stops. Um, so um, you can do this with um, uh, even uh, a crash dump. So remember I said when Microsoft, uh, there's a problem, you get the crash dump, you get the stack, and you get the PC. Well, if you know the, if you can determine the, the um, you know the path, right, which is what Frank asked, you know the path because the program executed, and if you know the faults, then we can help the Microsoft people diagnose root cause rather than have them do it uh, without knowing anything and telling them which one. Okay, there's been a lot of work on fault propagation research, but most of this work is done dynamically. So we're the first person, the first team that's looked at fault propagation statically, and um, we also defined what we mean by fault correlation. Um, there's been some work done. There's been some work done where they rank uh, fault ranking techniques, and what they're doing now is the, in these works is they're saying if you get a lot, a lot of false warnings, false positives or false negatives, they found in fact that, that they occur in the same parts of the program. So if you think about a program and you run these reports detection and you get some uh, false warnings, they're kind of clustered in particular parts of your program. And that comes from the correlation because there's something causing all of those. Um, root cause localization, there's been some work in that. How do you localize? And we, we, we've done some of that. Um, and there's been other types of correlations of program analysis, branch correlations. I'm one of my students, Russ Fodish. Uh, did that work, and correlations between faults in testing. And so, but most of this has been done, testing is dynamic, and so most of the work has been done dynamically. And dynamically, you, you don't have, uh, you, if you have the input, you can do it. If you don't have the input, then it's very hard. Uh, so conclusions, we developed the concept of false correlations. We show that it's useful in diagnosis, that it helps explain the consequences of the faults, um, and it provides the path where the correlation occurs. Um, we develop a correlation graph, which reduces the number and prioritizes the number, or prioritizes the faults to be diagnosed. Um, we develop a scalable, I told you that our demand-driven analysis runs on uh, the largest program we could find from Microsoft, in fact, which is one, no, I don't, it was a kernel program, 1.4 million lines of code in about less than a couple, than an hour. And so it's, uh, um, it's precise because we're using past sensitive analysis and it does it automatically. And we experimentally demonstrated that correlation does exist among faults. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Um, so, questions? Okay.